We're just going to give people a few more minutes just to sign on. We'll see the numbers rising, which is awesome. If you're here for a conversation with Sarah Weinman and Casey Seth from Politics and Press, you're in the right place. Um, just give us another minute or two as we let people sign on. And if you're not, this event is superior to whatever you were trying to log on to. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. 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 All right, folks. Hi, I'm Wendy Wasserman. I am uh, with Politics and Pros. We're delighted to have you all tonight. We're delighted to have Sarah. We're delighted to have Casey. I'm kind of like a secret fangirl of both of them. So um, this is a thrill for me. Um, today we are celebrating Scoundrel, uh, Sarah Wyman's new book. Everyone should get it. We'll put it in the chat uh, for you to purchase. It is pub week, so you can get it hot, hot off the press. Um, and we even have a limited amount of signed copies. Sarah was nice enough to come to the store yesterday to sign a bunch of copies. So if you buy it today, I'm sure we'll be able to get you one. Um, while, we, while we're uh, putting the link in and when you're on signing on and to, to purchase the book, take a wander around Politics and Prose's other offerings. You know us for books. But we have other things like we do a book a month club where we can curate books to, that we send to you. Um, based on your preferences. We also run a speakers bureau for authors to do private events. So there's a lot of stuff on there that you probably don't know that we do, which we would love for you to know. And for those of you who are uh, PMP veterans of, of these types of events, you know that your um, mic is on mute. We can't hear you, all, although you will be able to hear Casey and Sarah. Um, and we ask that you participate in the conversation by popping a question or two in the Q&A box at the bottom. Casey will be getting to those questions at the end of the hour. It's about an hour program. Um, but definitely put them in the Q&A box and not in the chat, just in case you can see them. And if you need a closed captioning, we also have that available. You should be able to turn that on at the bottom of your screen as well. So on to the show, as it were. So the uh, the woman of the hour tonight is Sarah Wyman. She is the author of Real Lolita, A Lost Girl, An Unspeakable Crime, and a Scandalous Masterpiece, and the editor, most recently, of Unspeakable Acts, True Tales of Crime, Murder, Deceit, and Obsession. But most importantly, she is the author of Scoundrel, which we're going to be talking about tonight. She is also a 2020 National Magazine Award finalist for reporting and a Calderwood Journalism Fellow at McDowell. Her work has appeared most recently in the New York Magazine, the Wall Street Journal, Vanity Fair, and the Washington Post. And she writes the crime column for, New for the New York Times Book Review, and she's joining us from New York today. KC Seth is a staff writer at The New Yorker and the author of Furious Hours, Murder, Fraud, and the Last Trial of Harper Lee which was a New York Times bestseller and named one of the best books of 2019 by the Washington Post, The Economist, Time Magazine, President Obama, and me, because I love the book too. Um, and she is joining us from the Eastern Shore. So ladies, um, what you got? Let's, let's chat. Yeah, thanks a lot, Wendy. Um, it's so much fun to be doing an event with Sarah and with Politics and Prose, such a great bookstore. Um, for those who don't know, um, in the process of unionizing, so truly a great place to buy any book you're in the market for, but especially Scoundrel, which is, you know, again, why we're, why, why we're here tonight. You can buy any of Sarah's books from Politics and Prose, but I hope by the end of the night you're sold on Scoundrel, which, you know, has the Rare distinction, a lot of times people tell you they're working on a book and you think, oh, that's very interesting, good luck. Um, I remember when Sarah <laughs> she was working on this book and instead of thinking, oh, good luck, I thought, oh, dang, I wish I had known that story. You know, what a fascinating story. And I was immediately envious of the opportunity to think through all of these interesting strands of American politics and the history of the courts and, you know, the, the deep ethical quandaries of celebrity activism, of exonerative projects, of 
um, all sorts of things. I mean, there is just such a rich idea. And I know, Sarah, you worked on this book for a long time, and we're going to get into all the research you did, but um, just an absolutely fascinating story and so many different strands to tease out and, you know, so many thousands of pages of everybody and their brother's letters to go through and you did it. You know, here is the book. Here it is. And, you know, I'm sure there were some lesser writers hoping you wouldn't finish so they could pick up the the strands themselves. But well, I is, mean, it's if, if there's one thing that I am good at is that if I have a deadline, I'm going to meet it. Like that, that it's almost like a pathological thing that I'm, I'm sort of incapable of of blowing a deadline because I just get so anxious and possibly a little bit paranoid that I have yeah. to finish it. And in fact. Um, this may not necessarily endear me to other writers, but I turned in the first draft early because I just was at a point where I had, I was like, I was at this mad rush and it was at the start of lockdown and I was just like feverishly going through dra this draft. And I was at McDowell where it was supposed to be for a month. And instead uh, it got cut short and we were sent home after I was there for 12 days, but I was still in that like first draft mindset that I didn't really sort of, I knew there was a pandemic, but I was trying to like willfully ignore it. So it wasn't until a couple of weeks in when the draft was done and I sent it to my agents that I was like, oh, pandemic. Okay, now to feel stuff. But um, I also just want to say it's such a pleasure to be talking with you, Casey, because we had such a good conversation about Unspeakable Acts a couple of years ago. And it's so great to be with politics and prose. And I'm so happy that the store is union as somebody who grew up very in a pro-union house. So it's just like all of that is great. So preamble aside, let's let's go back to it. <laughs> well, I'm Sarah Sarah Groupie, so it's true. We did talk about your anthology, Unspeakable Acts, which gathers together all of this recent crime writing. And for those who don't know, you have a newsletter, um, you know, about crime fiction, about crime nonfiction. It's really your beat and your bailiwick. And um, I think, I mean, I'm really curious. You know, this is a book where you could have just busied yourself with the research and with the kind of plot by plot of just this extremely complicated story. And so, you know, you call it in your introduction a wrongful conviction in reverse, which is a striking characterization of what happened. And I'm wondering, just take a few minutes, kind of tell us, tell us a little bit about Edgar Smith, what he was accused of, what he was convicted of, um, just broad strokes what happened, just so we all have a little bit of a footing because probably there are a lot of folks here who, um, don't know this case, or maybe they know some of the more famous people attached to it. But just go back to the beginning. What actually happened? What sets this? What sets this book in motion? Well, just to kind of set things up, I wrote Scoundrel in a way where I kind of started at the end and go back to the beginning. But that was a specific structural thing because I didn't want to write a book that was a whodunit or sort of a suspenseful. You don't you don't know what's happened next. It's how the hell did this happen? So, and how did how did all these forces sort of combine and all these people come together to create what is essentially a really bonkers story? But in order to do that, I have to start at the beginning again, which is with a 15 year old girl named Victoria Zelensky, who grew up in a small town in Bergen County, New Jersey called Ramsey. And on the night of March 4th, 1957, she went over to her friend Barbara Nixon's house living in the next town over. So she was walking the same street and then went over to her house, to Barbara's house. They did homework together. And then she had a whole thing worked out with her younger sister, Myrna, where they were supposed to meet halfway and walk home together. And Vicky didn't show up at the meeting point. And so Myrna came home and Vicky was missing. They, and then her father, because they went out and formed a search party with the family, and then the next morning, he found various articles of clothing, a scarf, some other stuff, and her body was at the bottom of a sand pit. And she had been pretty well brutalized. And so because of circumstantial evidence and various interrogations by the police, they landed on Edgar Smith, who was 23 years old. He had been so fairly recently married, his young wife, Patricia, who was 19 they had a three-month-old baby named patty ann at home they lived in a trailer park her mom was nearby his mother and her husband were also nearby it was sort of a small town thing and edgar he, he had served in the military he had washed out he had had various jobs nothing took he was married with a young kid and was kind of acting like a bachelor and even his friends who were still single were like what are you doing essentially it's time to grow up. It's the fifties. You have a wife and kid, but 
he knew Vicky slightly because she was going out on dates with a friend of his. And that figures later in the story because that friend would be very unjustly blamed for the, for the crime. Like what, when Edgar is ultimately arrested, it takes about 24 hours for the police to interrogate him and arrest him. There's a big circus of a trial. People like Mary Higgins Clark, the queen of suspense attend because that's sort of the, the big show in town because there aren't that many capital murder trials happening in Bergen County, New Jersey. So this is a big deal in that state across the border and nationally. And then it takes a jury a little less than two hours to convict Edgar of first degree murder and he is sentenced to death. And so that could have been an ending, but Edgar refused to die. He managed to avoid execution. At one point, a stay came in within half an hour of when the electric chair would have been pulled. And he makes a decision that part of this whole, I'm going to refuse to die is he's going to educate himself. He's going to take correspondence courses in college. He's going to read, he's going to start writing letters. And at one point, and he re, re, he's going to read a lot of magazines, and one of them, by virtue of a prison official who brings a copy of National Review to the, uh, the death house at New Jersey Strait Prison in Trenton, so he learns of it. It's a little cagey as to whether he actually read it in any way, shape, or form, but he mentions it in a, new, in a very friendly newspaper interview. And William F. Buckley, founder of the National Review and the architect of the conservative movement as he came, even though I think it doesn't really resemble it now, but certainly a lot of the seeds of conservatism have a lot to do with Buckley. He gets wind of it. A reporter writes a piece for National Review about Edgar's case and makes what seems to be a compelling argument that Edgar didn't do it or that there were problems with the confession. And so Buckley and Smith start corresponding. And then Buckley himself takes up the cause and writes a piece for Esquire in, in, six, in the October 65, going even further and saying that Edgar didn't do it and that maybe some other guy did it. Maybe this friend that Vicky was dating was the guy. Maybe it was, maybe the confession was bad. And then it just like kind of goes off in directions that were completely unforeseen. You don't expect that someone who is on death row would attract the attention of a political pundit figure like Buckley, who is running for that year, running for mayor of New York City, who is about to launch a television show called Firing Line, who has a column twice a week that's syndicated called On the Right, and is just attracting more attention as a cultural figure, and who actively believes in Edgar's innocence. And so from there, Edgar writes a book. <laughs> Edgar has a very uh, complicated relationship with that book's editor, and we'll talk about that. Let's stay with Buckley for a moment. Yes. Yeah, before, I, I want to I talk about Edgar's writing and the journalism and the fiction that grows out of it, but just stay with Buckley for a moment because, you know, you, you're right to point out it was this interesting moment in his career. His ambition was on the rise. He was about to run for political office, but Obviously, there's something even more striking and incongruous about his exonerative work on behalf of Edgar Smith, and that is part of the conservative movement he was organizing and arguing on behalf of was already, I mean, we, we can bracket part of this about the death penalty, and I want to talk about his Catholicism yeah. and that slice of things, but just for a minute, he's a law and order conservative, right? Part of what's yes. shocking about his interest in this case is really so talk to us for a minute i know you bracket his personality and his politics in the book and you talk about ways that diverge but just for a minute for those who don't know the national review or who need to be reacquainted with buckley's politics what what was so surprising about his activism in this case well so when buckley was younger he first made a name for himself in I believe 1951, publishing a book called God and Man at Yale, which was essentially arguing that Yale was too liberal and that Ivy Leagues were bastions of liberalism and that was terrible. And he had also been part of the CIA and came from privilege. And his father was like doing stuff in Mexico of a counter-revolutionary nature. He grew up Catholic. So I always feel like the Buckley family and there were, I believe, 10 siblings all told. So Buckley was in the middle 
and it, it just it, there was a real sense that it was that family against the world and not and they grew up in an enclave in Connecticut where they were one of the few Catholic families there. So they really sort of sense that you have to stick together, other viewpoints, you need to sort of like dominate. There's a real culture of argument and debate, and that would just be there throughout the rest of Buckley's career and life, that it was almost like he would write in a way that was very um, intimidating on the surface and stimulating and, and intellectually curious. But if you actually like dug underneath, there wasn't always a lot there and he would just dash columns off and make and write opinions that would get him into trouble. So one of them was this unsigned essay that was published in National Review, I think a couple of years after its inception. So it came into being in 1955 and this essay, Why the South Must Prevail was published in 57. And it was essentially saying that like Brown v. Board was terrible and what did black people need to have civil rights? And it was obviously hugely controversial and then Buckley doubled down and then he would have kind of walk it back a little bit later. And as a young person, he grew up and his fa like the whole family was deeply anti-Semitic and he would not um, repudiate that until he himself served in the war and was, I believe, part of liberating death camps. And so it was like that, that kind of undertaking would change his mind, but he also was like very much, if he had an opinion, he would stick to it and then argue it. But he also wanted to foster friendships with people who had differing opinions. And this is kind of what I tried to get into Scoundrel and trying to understand Buckley's mindset that here was someone who valued friendship and loyalty and that ideology, it wasn't just that it didn't come into play in friendships, it was something to be actively disdained which is how he could, I guess he could be friends with people like John Kenneth Galbraith or David Niven, who they, he was, he would hang out with them in Switzerland because, you know, he had enough money that he, he and his wife, Pat would have a winter home in Gestad and they would have a, a maisonette in the Upper East Side and a house in Stamford. Like that was just the moneyed world that they lived in. So that is all to say, it is incongruous that someone like Edgar Smith who was self-taught, whose education was spotty, who, you know, as it would emerge later, had bad teeth, spoke in an accent that was very much the antithesis of the way Buckley spoke. It wasn't, quote, cultured. But he wrote well because he had figured out how to write well. And he was, I think, a good mimic. Like when Buckley would write letters, and those letters would be fairly short like he was sort of he prized himself on trying to really be concise in his letters and so if anything exceeded two pages this was like a big deal mm -hmm. and for edgar who was constrained by prison limitations so he could only write on one full sheet of paper both sides mm -hmm. so in his correspondence with buckley which at first was just about legal stuff and then it became more a proper friendship you know i was i would sort of see that he was trying to like learn new words and level up a little bit. And I'm not sure that Buckley saw the full scope of Edgar's, not necessarily conniving, but maybe just calculation and how he was trying to communicate with Buckley. Sure. Because ultimately I think Buckley had so many blind spots about people and himself and that he would privilege those who he felt were worthy of his time. So, Someone like Ed. The National Review. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so, right. So I feel like it's, it's very right, circular. <laughs> right. But, but you start, you know, you, you start to position these two men and understandably someone who doesn't know as much about this case might kind of scratch their head and say, well, surely this was one sided. The convict wrote to him. But, you know, your book is made out of 1500 pages of correspondence that they exchanged. This was years yeah. of relationship and communication and collaboration, frankly. And I want to get to one of the things they work on together and bring in Sophie Wilkins. But stay with me for one moment, because I think that like there's this way that motive has like a certain register in true crime writing or in you know criminal. Yeah, can you see me grimace? Because like I have a whole thing that I think motive is overrated as a well, but talk narrative device. Yeah, well, so overrated <laughs> in true crime, but like talk to me about motive and friendship. Like, what is up? I feel like there's this like 
you know, really deep part of your book that is the central mystery, which is like, wind back the clock, you know, why does Buckley respond? You know, whatever, he reads this article about a guy, you know, in the death house on death row, who's a reader. There's a universe in which he said, that's nice and moved on. Or there's a universe in which he wrote one letter and never corresponded, or he wrote right. two, two stopped. And my question is like, stay with us for a minute and just tell us, because this ends up being humiliating for Buckley. You know, I don't want to yeah. blow the suspense of the book because there is a little bit of suspense. We, we know the outcome, but not the twists and turns. Suffice it exactly. to say, his, his exonerative efforts succeed. Um, yes. Smith commits another crime, jeopardizes the lives and the livelihood of many friends, family, you know, draws on huge resources from various cities when he's on the run. In any event, it turns out to be humiliating for Buckley. And so talk to me about, you know, this other kind of motive. Like, why does anyone do anything? Why does Buckley write back to this guy? Why does he start a defense fund? Why does he write an Esquire article? Like what you, you mean, mentioned, think it, Academy, you mentioned, you know, what, what's yeah. going on? I really think it's that he just bought into the line that Edgar was selling about his being innocent. And Buckley was, you know, there were other instances of Buckley being gullible that he would, you know, concurrently he owned some television networks. He had like a, you know, it wasn't like an empire, but he owned some stations. But he didn't actively run it because this was he was always like really scattered for time. He was always working on like 10 different things at once concurrently. And somehow he was able to just like he would be in his limo and typing up columns or working on scripts for firing line and then doing this and that and, you know, having his active social life. And like he was just really scattered. And so in this instance that I brought up about the TV stations, he had somebody installed to run it who did such a poor job that the SEC came for them and they had to settle. So he just, tr he, he trusted the wrong people a lot. And there were a couple of other instances that I learned of just, you know, staffers who he would keep on because he was personally loyal to them and he felt that that counted a lot more so that even if they expressed, rep you know, even more reprehensible views that they had something worth redeeming. And so I think with Edgar, Mostly he believed that he did not kill Victoria Zelensky. But if the argument was that maybe it was possible, then the confession was coerced and that there were problems with the evidence and he should at, at the bare minimum get a new trial. And that was worth something. But I keep coming back to what the original staffer at NR, Donald Cox, told me, which is this idea of we could never have imagined that somebody who wrote so well could be a savage killer. Sure, really, really sobering misunderstanding of, of the capacity of anyone to do harm to someone else, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah, which I do think, I mean, again, I just feel like there's this kind of, there's the narrative of what's going on in your book and then there's the subcurrent of just what is going on in human relationships. And again, the kind of deep sense of motive of not just why do we commit a crime, but why do we do anything? And how do we make decisions about other people and how do we get to know them? So, you know, I, I think it's it's a profound book. And I, I feel like there's a way that this conversation in a way that the book never does, you know, this is not an argument against celebrity activism or exonerative projects, right? Like, it's not a problem that Buckley- No, I don't want to, I right? don't want to indict- Right, right. I mean, I, on the one hand, I think it's an instructive lesson for how celebrity activism can go off the rails. And certainly when I started on what at first was supposed to be a magazine project, because this seems to be how I work into books, that I pitch them as possible magazine stories and then realize that they're much bigger and larger in scope and weirder and involving many more complications and that they really should be a book. And that's what happened with Scoundrel. But it's no accident that I really started working on it in at the end of 2014, which is also when the first season of Serial about the Adnan Syed case became such a sensation and frankly created this ongoing true crime moment that we're still in and created the space for, you know, different and rich storytelling of true crime and people accepting the genres being quote more highbrow than it was before, although I'd also have issues with that. But I would also just, you know, in reading up and researching Edgar's case, I'd look at the Adnan Syed case and go, okay, I think probably there are 
deep problems in the first season of Serial and the podcast Undisclosed and the subsequent documentary certainly do a great job of filling that in. But if he got out and something happens, what moral responsibility do people bear for this becoming a cause celebre? And also the case that I thought of a great deal as I was working on this was what happened with Jack Henry Abbott, who was a convicted murderer whom Norman Mailer started writing to while he was working on uh, the Executioner's Song, which was about Gary Gilmore and his, his execution by firing squad and his whole life and and all of that. And it becomes a like thousand page book. Right. So he writes Abbott and also feels like he has literary merit and talent and helps get his prison writings published and advocates for him at a parole hearing so that he is subsequently released. And then, of course, when In the Belly of the Beast is published in 1981, on the very day that it gets a rave review from the New York Times, Abbott has killed Richard Adden in a bar in Greenwich Village and would subsequently go back to prison. And this became incredibly embarrassing for Mailer, who was much more public about it. With Buckley, when everything happened with Edgar Smith upon his release and the blip of, of celebrity that he had and how everything just declined in spectacular fashion. And then yes, he does come close to killing another woman and would subsequently spend the rest of his life in prison. Buckley writes one more piece for Life Magazine in 79, and that's it publicly. He just doesn't talk about it. There would be some private reflections, which was very interesting for me to learn. But I think just it was just a subject that was like a no-go zone. It was like too toxic that people who knew him subsequently, I would ask them and they all of a piece said, no, he never discussed this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember reading some, I mean, there are just so many of these. And again, I, I just wanted to give you the chance to explain that this isn't like discouraging people from getting involved in criminal justice reform or looking into cases where there might've been miscarriages of justice. Because for me, I always think of Johnny Cash and Gene Shirley. And you know, there are just yeah. so many of these where it seems to me like, the story is complicated and it's not as straightforward as we shouldn't begin to get involved in the lives of incarcerated people or that it isn't worth investigating these cases or that there isn't some kind of moral relationship we can form even with those who are incarcerated. So I just felt like somehow I was steering you down the road of it was humiliating for Buckley. He should have regretted it all. And why didn't he? And, well, I mean, I've, I and I've had that re I've had that reaction from people who are like, oh, well, he's really complicit and, and anger inducing. And I get it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I would feel that way, but then I would have to stop myself because I just felt throughout this entire project that it was really important for me to empathize and figure out, well, what would I do in this situation? And, and I think it would be very easy to fall under a spell of somebody like Edgar, who was essentially cold reading his subjects and parroting what they wanted to hear and exploiting... Well, yeah, yeah, let's talk about somebody else who um, far less famous than Buckley, um, kind of a blank slate figure, but you you pursue a similar investigation of what happened to her. And that's Sophie Wilkins, this editor at Knopf. So we've talked about the criminal justice side and what Buckley was up to with his legal activism, but enter Sophie Wilkins. Tell us a little bit about her and this kind of other literary dimension to Edgar's story. So Sophie Wilkins enters the chat, so to speak. Um, when she reads Buckley's Esquire piece. And she is a, an editor at Knopf. And she had joined Knopf, I think in 1959, she was 44, which is unusual. Like most people, when you start as an editorial assistant at a book publishing house, you're in your early 20s. But she had already lived several lives. She had, she was born and raised in Vienna and with her family emigrated to the United States in the late 20s, did not speak a word of English, had to pick up in school and did so quite quickly. She graduated, I believe at 16, went to Brooklyn College, went to Columbia for a master's and was pursuing a doctorate. She had one brief marriage and then married a psychiatrist who became the father of her children. He had mental health issues. She, while she was, I believe an assistant or a secretary in the English department, mostly working for Lion, the critic Lionel Trilling, she met Thurman Wilkins, who became husband number three, he was an academic and, um, you know, very capable, very good stepfather. But by the time that she is reading Buckley's piece, 
she is essentially caregiving for him because he's having a lot of mental breakdowns or about to her her sons have moved away far away for college she's at knopf and she's managed to get promoted but she's having trouble acquiring projects and she her personality was such that at a place like knopf where people were mostly reserved and they were quiet and she was very gregarious and open and emotive and people just didn't know what to make of her and so she reads this article and is sort of compelled to write buckley and to donate to the defense fund because at the end of the article there's a a, a missive here's the um, mailing address for sending money to this ed defense fund for edgar smith so sophie does that and she says based on the letters of edgar that buckley is quoting he seems to have enough talent that maybe if he's working on a book i'd like to take a look at it so nothing really happens for a little while but then edgar tells buckley that he is working on a book so then buckley gets in touch with sophie and then through edgar's mother she begins a correspondence with edgar and at first it was strictly professional this would have been in the summer of 67 and she's just writing him about what it is to be a book editor and whether he needs an agent and what books he needs to be reading but over time, and it doesn't take that long, that's what was really striking as I was reading through this correspondence, is that, you know, by the fall, they were already sort of going down this very blighted garden path of inappropriate <laughs> exchanges. And by the end of 67, they're essentially declaring love for one another, and it gets really explicit and X-rated. And not by this point, they're moving past the one page letters on double sided that the Trenton state prison censors would allow. And he's writing her these epics through his lawyer, because if he sends correspondence through them that they, they won't get censored. So it just, it's, and, and I included a lot of that, although I kept a fair amount of it out because mostly for narrative judiciousness, but I wanted to have enough of a sense that you see how this strictly professional relationship just goes off the rails because it mimics my own experience of being at Columbia University where Sophie's papers are held. And the first time that I went in in February of 2016, and I'm just looking through these boxes thinking that I'm just going to be reading an editor and an author corresponding, nothing much to do. And then I start reading, uh, I can't remember which so one. No but. Idea. I had no idea. You had no idea. Oh, wow. Okay. No, I went Same into the archive totally cold, just thinking I knew Sophie's name because I knew that she was thanked in, I believe, Brief Against Death. Or, I, I had known that already. And then I just was Googling and I found the reference to her archive. So I was like, cool, I'll just request some boxes and make a day of it and do a preliminary fact finding mission and see what, what's there. And then I, I'm reading this correspondence and it's just completely like beyond the scope of anything I could have imagined. And I'm sitting in the rare books and manuscripts library, trying not to scream and trying not to like, you know, react in any way, because I don't know that anyone has read this except maybe the archivist. And even then, I don't know how much they were really processing what was going on, but because I knew the whole story and I could contextualize it, immediately i was like oh now i know there's a book here <laughs> well, it's so really that's how i learned yeah well you hadn't told me about the editorial relationship when you told me you told me about buckley's involvement and i was interested and in, you know when you sent the galley of your book for those I, i'm not spoiling anything because for folks who haven't bought it which if you haven't you need to get it but sarah makes this interesting decision she tells us in the introduction about sophie's taboo relationship with, with yeah. her father and it's so fascinating to me. I just assume maybe everybody who knew anything about the case knew that because yep. I remember my jaw dropping, you know, I'm four pages into your book and it's already like riveting. And then I'm like, I literally remember saying to my wife, holy moly, like, <laughs> and you know, like what's going on? And I said, wowza, like buttoned up Kanaf editor, just like, but again, let's go to motive. Why did she keep all the letters? You only were able to uncover this relationship because of so again, I had no idea. It's completely absent the historical record for this case. Oh All yeah, people know that they collaborated on this book. She managed to help him get published. She, she was basically just a name in the story. It was only what people knew and what had been written about was Buckley and Smith. 
anything yeah. to do with Sophie was not in the record. It was uh, basically okay. I, I discovered it all pretty much all of it. And it's because I don't know, I guess nobody bothered to look or nobody bothered to make those connections. But it turned out not only was Sophie an integral figure in the Edgar Smith story, but then she and Buckley stayed friends until the end of her life. And she died in 2003. And she became well, his she because she kept everything. I, 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 no, no, no. I don't know why she and Buckley kept talking, but like, I'm sorry, she volunteered for posterity the nature of this relationship. And again, you got for people who haven't read it yet. These are this is like a very very straightforwardly taboo relationship, right? There's there's no ambiguity. She tried oh, to no, say no. later maybe she had just been courting his favor to try and acquire the book because other publishers were interested. But but again, why? Give me motive here. Like, what's she thinking donating these so that the Sarah Wyman's of the world come along? <laughs> I I don't think she was thinking. So based on what her eldest son Adam told me. She was the type of person who just reflexively kept everything and just didn't want to think about it. So they were just like boxes and boxes and boxes in her apartment on 106th Street in Manhattan that just stayed there. And it was like they had to, I guess, I don't know. I don't know if she was a hoarder because I've never seen pictures of the inside of her apartment beyond a, a few pictures of her with, you know, near paintings on walls. But I just, I don't know, maybe, maybe she wanted people to find out, but she also felt a lot of embarrassment and shame and remorse over what happened because she, she helped perpetuate this narrative that Edgar Smith was an innocent man on death row. And in doing so completely negated the story and the existence and the significance of this 15 year old girl, Victoria Zielinski who never had a chance to do anything because she was her, her skull was smashed in by Edgar in a fit of rage. So it was very easy to just like, oh, let's just put that aside because there's a book to bring into the world. So I just think that her own personality flaws contributed to what happened and possibly to why she kept everything. But she also, I think, maybe just instinctively just like to keep all correspondence because Edgar wasn't her only correspondence. There was a lot with Buckley. It was beyond the scope of scoundrel, but she was a notable translator. So there was a lot of correspondence related to that work or with Saul Bellow, who she also became friends with. So like there's a whole history of Sophie that could be written and I could see myself losing years if I wanted to do that. But I was like, nope, got to stay on my tunnel vision and, and, write this book. Well, I feel like, I mean, until that point, I was about to say, Sarah, you're just such a fantastic advertisement for archives, meaning <laughs> what is forward, you know, just, just exhortation to those of us who, who do this kind of writing and who are interested in narrative journalism, you know, what a great straightforward, you know, that kind of work is always rewarded go to the archives, read the back of the pages, don't take for granted. Turn every page. Just turn every page. This we're quoting Robert Carroll here. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that's just fascinating to realize this whole, I mean, if you've read the book, this whole, you know, room in the mansion that is scoundrel opens up in Sophie's life and in the world of publishing and in the ethics of how you know, power works, you know, again, yeah. there's gender politics between the two of them, there's editorial politics, we really see the ins and outs of publishing, like what makes a bestseller, how a book is acquired, there's, there's so many things that just, I can't believe, like, there wouldn't be that whole part of the book if you hadn't actually sat down and gone through the boxes, so it's really great, I, I mean, I, I just, it is, I know COVID has kept a lot of us from looking through kind of original materials or I got it. so lucky that I was able to get to the archives before lockdown. So I was working in Sophie's in 2016 and the end of 18 and early 19. And then when I, when I finally, finally got permission to access William F. Buckley's papers at Yale, I spent a couple of research trips, I think it's September and November of 2019. And that was just an instance of, I'm just gonna get as much material as I can. I took my iPad and had a scanner app and just was just going, boop, boop, you know, like that. And, only, and that, but at the same time, Buckley's archives were integral too, because he kept a lot of material, especially court documents related to the case. So for example, on my first visit to Yale, 
within five minutes, I had the married name of Edgar Smith's first wife after she divorced him, which I had been looking for. And because I was able to get that name, I was able to figure out the name of their oh, daughter. Yeah, yeah. And, and then I tracked her down. I emailed her from the archives because, you know, yay Wi-Fi. And she responded like an hour later and said, sure, I'll talk to you. So I have to, you know, I guess I have to thank Christopher Buckley for finally saying yes, because yeah, I was able yeah. to come up with not only key sources, but key documents in order, because unlike the real Lolita, where I really was fishing for information and every little scrap had to be in the book, because otherwise it was, like, it really felt like not scraping the bottom of the barrel, but it was just, I had to work really hard to find stuff. And in this instance, I had more material than I could possibly know what to do with, that it was really a matter of how do I shape this unformed clay into something resembling a coherent book? And what do I leave yeah. in and what do I take out? And what, what information, wh whose stories do I need to prioritize? Sure. Well, I kind of feel like we're experiencing that like in this kind of mimetic way of like, what the heck? I, I can't believe I'm almost out of time to ask my questions about the book. And I want to get to some audience questions, but let me ask you one kind of brief question. And then I have one kind of just, curiosity but the, okay. the the kind of small technical question i have is it's so interesting you're talking about the original case files and i know sarah that, that you actually have a technical background in criminal justice and you know a lot about the courts and i'm curious it turns out that the intricacies of edgar smith's case are actually quite complex and for instance like i, I didn't know that much about the non-volt contendery plea and you know there's just there's just oh yeah there's kind of, I mean, somebody would call it minutia, but there's just this really rich technical level at which you dissect the case. And that turns out to be really important because a lot of times the, the activism, whether it's the Innocence Project or someone else, often you're going back through court records, really looking for these finely grained distinctions or evidentiary rulings. And, you know, it, it turns out it's not just what did the judge or the jury decide, but every little decision along the way. And I'm wondering, just talk to us for a minute about kind of how you manage that sort of research and detail and figure out what's important or not and what we need to know. Because there's a version of this, which is just like, well, he was convicted and then they reversed the conviction and that's how it happened. But you really sit us down in the courtroom and you sit us down in the evidentiary hearings and in the judicial appeals process. And how do you manage that in this book and in your work more generally? Well, I mean, it's always a tricky thing because you don't want to get too subsumed in legal jargon and you want to be able to explain to the layperson what is going on. But it was really important to convey in Edgar's case that there were multiple stays of execution, that there were there was grounds for reversal. And also on the bigger picture, that this was all happening against the backdrop of a Supreme Court that was ruling on decisions that was changing the way that police were would um, arrest suspects and conduct interrogations. And so essentially, because Edgar was arrested in a pre-Miranda world, and by Miranda, it's the Miranda ruling of, you know, you, you have the right to remain silent and anything you can say, you, you know, whatever. The whole thing that, like, if you watch any episode of Law & Order, you'll know. But that didn't exist until 66. And before then, there were a couple of other rulings that kind of laid the groundwork for Miranda. So because of that, it was really important for me to you know, I didn't want to bog the narrative down in all of the technical details, but there had to be some of that so people could understand the larger picture of what was happening with Supreme Court rulings, why people were moving away from the death penalty, why it was, as we discussed before, so seemingly incongruous that you could have anti-death penalty arguments in National Review, which would appear to be such a law and order magazine and Buckley reflect Buckley's worldview. But, and then when Edgar is freed, having plead, plead, having pled guilty to Vicky's murder on a second degree charge, getting time served and getting out, but then immediately on firing line saying, oh, well, I was just doing that so I could get out. And this would, you know, come up as could, could he have perjured himself, whatever. So this was all happening as the death penalty, there's another Supreme Court ruling that takes the death penalty off the table for a few years. And then the year that he's arrested, the Supreme Court finally essentially reinstates it. And so here we are now. So I, it was interesting to kind of like map the contours of this individual person's story to the larger backdrop of American criminal justice and 
essentially pose questions. Well, what's really changed? What have we learned? Why were certain arguments more acceptable then versus now and vice versa? And I still grapple with all that. Yeah, and I know, I mean, again, I, I have one more question for you. I wish we could get into, you You mentioned Norman Mailer earlier, and I know we were hoping to talk some about Capote. And I just wonder with Buckley, who, again, one way in which his advocacy in this case is completely consistent with his politics is he's a devout Catholic. And yes. the opposition to the death penalty is completely consistent with Catholicism and Orthodox view and the sanctity of life is is upheld in that church and the Pope's own activism to try and end the death penalty here and elsewhere is again, you know, completely in keeping with the faith there. So I, I, I sometimes wonder whether it's Buckley or Capote or Mailer, you know, if they could fat flash forward to 2022, I don't think they would believe that we're still arguing over the death penalty. I don't think they would believe actually that it was still the law of the land and that absolutely- I feel like Capote might. Or could, and maybe- a pessimist, or he'd be like- Yeah, I mean, he's, look, he's the guy who's like, I read Edgar's book and and oh, yeah. I could blurb it, but I, he's guilty as hell, so I I have to say that. And yeah, yeah, then later well. tells Buckley essentially, I never I never yet met a man who wasn't like that. Essentially, anyone on death row was guilty, and certainly Capote right. interviewed quite a number of men on death row in the aftermath of In Cold Blood, and this became like this whole thing that didn't end up going anywhere like he do, he does this documentary death row usa that is killed by abc and has never been shown since which is now another mystery that i would like to solve but that's a side yeah, point but but i do think right. that i don't know i mean i look at someone like kyle rittenhouse or a lot of these scammers and i just see that they're kind of descendants of edgar that and it's that human behavior doesn't really change it's just technology that changes or context that changes, but people are always going to be susceptible to those who would do them harm or who are going to find ways to build them or to seduce them or to do far worse and assault them or harm them or rape them or kill them. So I don't think, it, you know, it's like he's not a boogeyman or, and anyone who's a serial killer is kind of you know just they're just people so it's important for me to always remember that that i'm just trying to get into into i'm trying to understand why people behave the way they do because it's often maddeningly consistent across generations sure well and not that one's opposition to the death penalty need be predicated on the innocence of of, of those sentenced to die i mean i think that's yeah. one of the complications of, of of this kind of moral reasoning it does not it need not be predicated on innocence, but okay. I, I swear this is my last question. <laughs> I'm going to go to the chat. Um, but my question, Sarah, you mentioned Bob Kolker, who um, a great crime writer, I gather, a friend of yours. And um, there was something people ask me about the title of my book all the time, and and I cherish it. So forgive me if you don't like to speak to your title. But um, this is like the bad art friend. Um, yeah. They're all scoundrels, you know, some more scoundrelly than others, but who is the scoundrel in this book? And oh, you know, no, it Edgar, should be like, the it's absolutely, do you have any, you know, it's all Edgar. Okay. It's all, I mean, and, and I, and the reason it's it ended up being called editor, it's not the conniving editor who like, you know, seduced the book out of him. It's not William Buckley who like, no, the South to ride again. No, it's because just Edgar. It's just Edgar because ultimately, he is the inciting force for everything that happens and all of the harm that ensues and all of the violence and all of the complicity. None of this would ever have happened if not for him. And it's also, I think scoundrel as a word has become kind of denuded. Like to me, I, you know, I, I went and looked at the definition and it means somebody who's done really reprehensible things. And Edgar counts as somebody who's a proper scoundrel. It's not the scoundrel of a romance hero. So I kind of wanted to reclaim that word. Is that, that's true etymologically? Like, sorry, yeah. now I, 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 I'm looking at the questions. The audience is like, will you stop talking? That's true etymologically, that, that scoundrel, that kind of rakish 
playful yeah. version is more, oh, gotcha. Okay, well, someone, one of these questions is, I'm gonna hold this up again, because you need to get your copy, Scoundrel, it's in the chat. You buy it from Politics and Prose, it's signed, support a union shop. Um, they're the only reason we're able to have these conversations. So you're gonna buy it from Politics and Prose. Someone wants to know, can you talk about the cover? It seems uh, very deliberately designed to reflect the story, which is Beth's question, very astute. She's probably already read it. Um, tell us about the cover. I will hold it up for okay. um, the or so, pull it up on your computer. Sure. So um, the cover has a photo of Edgar Smith and the back of William F. Buckley. And it was taken on the episode of Firing Line that they taped immediately after Edgar was released from New Jersey State Prison. The girl sort of diagonally opposite Buckley is Victoria Zelensky, the 15 year old whom Edgar murdered. And I want, I actually did want that. That placement, I think, was the work of the art designer. So in the initial draft, it was just Edgar Buckley and Vicky. And I liked that Buckley's back was to Vicky because I felt that that was psychologically significant. But I was like, I don't just want a cover where Edgar is the most prominent figure on it because that's not the story. He's, you know, he, he may be the tit the titular character but he's also the least interesting person in the story. So I wanted a group of the women whom he you know, directly and deliberately harmed and I wanted them present. So it's like top right corner is Patricia with Patty Ann in 1957. And then next to her is Juliet Scheinman who is the woman who starts corresponding with him around 1969 and then becomes his first like IRL girlfriend after he is uh, released. Underneath is um, the second wife, Paige Heimeyer, whom Edgar marries after he's freed. He's like 20 years older and she has a lot of physical similarities to his first wife, Patricia, when they married. And then next to her is Sophie Wilkins, the book editor and who, whose presence frankly shaped the entire writing of the book. And without her, I don't think there could be a book. Well, and there's this like subtle red shade, which, you know, is both like, what is the National Review for and against and what does it come to symbolize? And um, I know you just wrote something about Nabokov and Buckley. So I'm curious, if this is like anti-communist mag, like red becomes associated with the conservative movement. But um, I'm going to just insert one little question here, which is, you mentioned Mary Higgins Clark covered the original I trial. I think we're game to talk about some of the other kind of walk on, walk off characters. We we named Chuck Capote, but I mean, Buckley had this incredible literary life and, you know, got to know a lot of different people. And it sounds like from all of your time in the archives, can you talk to us a little bit more just about um, some of the minor characters from both his life and, and this case? Well, so the ways in which Buckley and Sophie cemented their friendship, especially later, it's because they both had a shared love of the pianist Rosalind Turek, who was a specialist in Bach, who was Buckley's favorite composer. I was actually just emailing with someone who goes to a church where the Bösendorfer piano that Buckley used to own is now there, which I need to kind of investigate further. But the point is he was like a real like classical piano geek. Yeah, yeah. And then another author that they helped launch was David Quammen. I was about to say, David Quammen is like the most surprised, again, I like, you know, <laughs> my wife is a big David Quammen fan, like what's up with this young Yale student who Buckley says, right. he introduces him to Sophie Wilkins, right? Like gets him. Yes. Into, yeah. And then yeah. she reads his novel and is becomes his editor at Knopf. So that novel, which was like about a friendship between a white college kid and a black college kid, that was his first published effort. And then he basically, as he told me, like wrote nothing for years and years and years until he finally figured out he should be writing nonfiction. And now we know him as the esteemed science writer. I think actually the first I ever heard of Quammen was through Catherine because she kept like talking about him on Twitter or something. And I was like, who is this guy? And then he, he, po you know, he shows up in, the, in this story, which yeah. just goes to show like the level, the deep level of incidental characters that I was having to deal with and then also being like, okay, how much can I include? I don't want, you know, I didn't want the whole Quammen thing to take over the narrative. So I think it was just maybe two paragraphs in this whole book, but at the same, and similarly with Mary Higgins Clark, that she attended the trial, but also for her, like the Edgar Smith case really helped her become a crime writer. Like she just would follow it and she never forgot it. 
she incorporates it into Where Are the Children, her first novel of suspense that launches her, you know, essentially um, is a smash success and creates her career as the quote, queen of suspense. And she wrote an essay a few years after that about Edgar and essentially explaining how this case made her into a crime writer. So it's just like something about this case just affected a whole lot of different people at different stages of their career. And now I feel like I'm sort of bringing it all together in Scoundrel. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think that, so I, I just think there is such a richness to this and it's interesting. There's a question from someone who I think is kind of picking up on one of the threads you were tracing earlier and they're curious about in the thousands of pa the 1500 pages that Buckley and Smith exchange with one another, um, they want to know the three most outrageous things that Buckley quote unquote fell for. And I think you've already, you've intimated one, which is you don't seem convinced that Edgar Smith had ever even read the National Review. Like no, and, and, the re and I'll tell you why I know. It's because I found this out after the book was done and I was in like second pass, which is just like, you know, a, a later round of Sorry. edits. You don't know it's a terrible for writers because it's like too late to change anything. And also there's so much, there's so much inside baseball about publishing that I had to cut as, as a former publishing reporter that it just felt so sad. It's like, oh no, but people shouldn't. It's like, no, actually they shouldn't. <laughs> but he, he did an interview for the second nonfiction book that he wrote. He wrote it while he was in prison, but it was published after he was out and it's called Getting Out. So he was talking with Studs Terkel and I'm listening to this whole exchange and it's just fascinating because anything that Studs Terkel does, I, I love to listen to. He was such a phenomenal interviewer. And then at one point, Edgar brings up the whole National Review thing. He's like, yeah, that whole story was kind of like, I kind of, I didn't, I didn't read the magazine. <laughs> and I just was like, ah! <laughs> yeah, cool. there's my proof. Right. So that's one, obviously, even the initial seduction of like, I'm interested in your writing and your philosophy and your ideology. Um, but they want to know, give us two others, um, two particularly egregious things that, that, that he fell for hook, line and sinker. Well, I just think that how Edgar presented himself in tune with conservative thought, I don't know that he really had those thoughts. I think that he was like many people with diagnosed personality disorders, which Edgar was at various points while he was in prison. I just feel like he would just say things that would elicit the most ideal responses to sort of keep things going. And part of it, was, like I think a lot about this exchange that I reprinted in full where Buckley is on the campaign trail as mayor and he's getting endorsements from police unions and is very law and order and Edgar is essentially schooling him on what it's actually like to be for people that he knew who are poor and black who are on death row and why it's very different and Buckley's just like not getting it. So it was just the incongru incongruity that Edgar had a much more sophisticated quote sense of what it was like for people in prison that Buckley ever could and that's that sort of came through. And then the third thing I don't know if there was a third thing. I think they all kind of come back to the first thing. It's just Edgar was telling Buckley what he wanted to hear and he just would continue doing that over and over again. So was it a real friendship? I think Buckley thought so and then it clearly wasn't. Edgar cl would claim it later and at various points. And I think it's like maybe he had some faint remorse, but I think he just wasn't capable of it fundamentally. Well, and I just think, I mean, again, I keep coming back to this idea of motive, which I, I think can be inscrutable even unto ourselves. It does feel to me that sometimes the things that motivate us, whether, you know, for instance, like how does Buckley become Buckley? And you talk- Or like, why do I keep writing stories of misogyny and of overlooked women and girls? Sure. Clearly this is a thematic thing in my own writing life and my own psyche. Mm -hmm. And I always believe that compulsion is the greatest driver creatively. So maybe that's mine and Buckley had his. Yeah. Well, there's just, there's one other question I want to get to here before we run out of time. And this is a person who's kind of, um, I think appropriately connecting our conversation about celebrity advocacy, which often tends in the exonerative direction and um, sometimes has produced you know, I give John Grisham's nonfiction project to just sometimes produces extraordinary results. And, yes. you know, 
and and we benefit greatly from the times that cause celebs sort of settle on appropriate and, and, and worthy objects. But they're actually asking about celebrity condemnation and they're bringing up um, President Trump and the Central Park Five. You know, um, so talk about this from the, the other side, which is, you know, <laughs> the rush to judgment when cases, um, you know, be, become cause celebs and, and lead to, you know, quick condemnation. Well, I mean, Trump taking out an ad calling for the death penalty for these kids who, as we would later discover, had nothing whatsoever to do with the rape of Trisha Miley because a man named Matias Reyes was raping and killing women concurrently. And so it's interesting that this person brought up that story because a few years ago I wrote a magazine piece for The Cut on those women because in the process of exonerating the five young men, their stories had been completely forgotten. And so it, I really felt called to put this larger narrative together that here was this incredible injustice done to these five boys and others who were, you know, in the vicinity as well. And meanwhile, why didn't we know more about these other women who were victimized and who had trauma and it, you know will last the rest of their lives. So there are always these larger narratives that are part of the very specific ones. And so we can't divorce injustice. It just seems like it's all connected. And it's really important to me to sort of like bring those all together as opposed to just trying to look at individual injustice because that's not the way things work. Yeah, I think that's really useful and, and certainly represented in your work. And I know that Wendy wanted me to warn her when I was going to do the last question. That was it, um, which I think kind of really powerfully does redirect people back to Scoundrel and to your other work, The Real Lolita, Unspeakable Acts. Um, I just want to say, I mean, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. And I, I know people are going to go read the book, but um, I also just feel kind of personally grateful for the reminder to just like, research is always rewarded and always work is rewarded and it's just so incredible oh. to know the parts of your book that just like opened up from nothing so i just want to say i've already read the book everybody else needs to but i want to say thanks for the reminder that it's just always good to go and always good to read and, and important to kind of never give up on on the source material thank you it means so much for you to say that and for just the thoughtful and wonderful questions you've had tonight and that people are tuning in and paying attention and that they will read Scoundrel and take away all sorts of possible less, maybe not lessons, but just like questions to grapple with. Because that's what I feel like is much, it's so important as a writer and as a author that you're trying to open up conversations, not close them down. And that's what I want to do with Scoundrel too. Well, with that, uh, many thanks to both of you, Sarah and Casey. Um, I have to say, I've read it and um, totally riveting. And I'm not a true crime girl. So, I mean, this is, to me, I think, Casey, your point is well taken about the value of archives. That's where my heart lies. So thanks to both of you. It is a fun read. It's a great read. We have it for you. It's signed. Thanks to Sarah's little jaunt to DC. Um, and um, thank you for joining us tonight. And bye book and yay Sarah. Thank you so thanks much, you Wendy. All. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Congratulations. It's really a lot of fun. Thank you, Casey. And I hope we can see each other in person sometime soonish. Oh my gosh, I know. No kidding. Well, um, I'm sure that some of these folks are going to like, you know, hound you with emails once they read it. And, um, you know, I just hope it's a fun week. It's really just congratulations. I know you worked hard on it. And I hope the pandemic doesn't stop it from being too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> You're, let's